Hello, everyone. Pete Davis here, your host of This Is What Democracy Looks Like. We have a special episode today because I wanted to replay on this feed an interview I did on the Current Affairs podcast with Nathan J. Robinson. The reason I wanted to replay it here is because it is an interview about the home organization of this podcast, the Democracy Policy Network, or DEEPEN for short. And I felt like the interview did a good job of explaining what we're all about at DEEPEN. And I thought it would be a good overview for those who wanted to know what's the deal with the whole operation of which this podcast, This Is What Democracy Looks Like, is a part. Next week, we'll be back with ordinary episodes with state policy experts. For now, here's my interview with Nathan J. Robinson, in which he asks me questions about Deepin, the Democracy Policy Network. Enjoy. Good evening, Current Affairs listeners. My name is Nathan Robinson. I am the editor of Current Affairs Magazine, and I am here tonight with a familiar voice. It's Mr. Pete Davis, the former host of the Current Affairs Podcast, who has now moved on to something that I am uh, truly excited. We, you're going to find out why Pete Davis is no longer the host of the Current Affairs Podcast, because he has moved on to something that, while I would vouch for the seriousness and importance and consequential consequentialness of the Current Affairs Podcast, what Pete Davis is doing now is is something that is really uh, extraordinary, uh, really ambitious, and could really have quite an effect in uh, states around the country. So I'm uh, excited to have back the great friend of uh, of current affairs, Mr. Pete Davis. Hello, Pete. Oh my gosh, Nathan, that was so touching. Uh, I'm so glad to be here as a guest. It feels different. Yes. Walking well, back around Studio H3 in the Current Affairs World Headquarters. Yeah. You got the softballs before. You got to lob the balls before, but now you're getting interrogated. Because yes, no, it, you... it feels like when you go back to campus after you've left school. Uh, yeah, you, you know? don't want to. You know, I Walking never. I don't around. go back to campus. But yeah, here you are. <laughs> so uh, you have started, you have co founded something called the Democracy Policy Network, which has had its debut and is now you know hard at work but i actually don't want to start by talking about the democracy policy network first i want to start first by talking about the context of the democracy policy network so i want to talk about instead the american legislative exchange council and yes, yes. the situation that you know you looked out at the landscape of state politics and saw things happening and and what those things are that alarmed you so much yes you know okay so there is this organization called the american legislative exchange council which if you haven't heard of it it's known by alec and alec is an organization that feeds right-wing, corporatist, profiteering, reactionary state legislators in states across the uh, country model policy. So if you ever hear a news story that's like six states have passed, you know, a new poll tax or whatever, you know, or, yeah. or a ban on helping people get to the polls or a legalization of even smaller fine print contracts or the ability to uh, extract oil. Uh, these are all examples of uh, fake examples. I could get you yeah. some real ones later from state parks. It's probably Alec behind it because here's the thing. State legislators are completely understaffed. We do not invest in the governance at the state level, and most states do not. Most of them are, many of them are part-time. They often have one staffer or they share a staffer between them. They're usually run by these central kind of like party leaders that control all the information. Um, and it's very hard for any given one to kind of like get a handle on something. Um, and any corruption you think is happening in Washington, think of all the watchdog groups in Washington. There's all these good groups in Washington. In many state houses, there's not even one or two watchdog groups. So it is a problem. And the right has seized this by creating an interstate policy infrastructure for the right, Alec, to help pass national policies at an interstate level. Um, so that is the problem of Alec and the problem of state legislators. Because even if you had... 
you know, so Republicans have control in a lot of state legislatures, but when these Republicans get there, it's still true that they don't exactly know what to writing legislation, even even evil legislation, is not uh, is not easy necessarily. <laughs> and you know, a lot of people think it's all about the model bills. So they're like, we need the model bills. We need the model bills. But actually, it's not even just the model bills because oftentimes you know, these legislatures have drafting offices where you can send, like, the bill you want in prose and they'll turn it into legalese. It's really just the concept of, like, having a conception at all of that this agency does this thing and this thing should be reformed in this way. That is kind of the thing that's missing. It's not just there's not enough lawyers at these state houses writing the bills. It's that, you know, who knows that uh, AG office has this power or this public university office has this power or this health department has this power Mm. that a state could change. And Alec feeds to all these state legislators, you know, oh, did you know you could change this rule of this corporate tax provision and it'll do this or this regulation, it'll Mm -hmm. do this. And then they're able to all move at once. And they've been quite successful, as I understand it, right? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) They've not only been successful at controlling like getting policies they've wanted they've been successful at controlling structures like generative policy that weakens democracy and thus entrenches their power to do even more policy into the future it's very clever like every time i think about it i was like that's a that's brilliant i was like i'm always like well well done well done, the, uh, the the far right. You've really hit on what you need to do in order to slowly, uh, slowly move things in, in your direction. But we have had over the past few years, we've gotten a lot of lefties elected to state houses, to city councils. You know, we know that there has been this wonderful, inspiring left political movement But we face kind of the same problem where a lot of people, isolated people, get into, you know, if you have a few DSA people in the in the state legislature, setting the agenda for a state is not necessarily is not necessarily easy for someone who gets there and goes, well, now what? Yeah, it's it's funny. We often say our goal is to help people convert their ideals into ideas. You run in poetry, but you govern in prose, as the old saying goes. And the poetry is the idea that things like current affairs and and you know different Bernie and different political movements have pushed which is like even a conception of running as a DSA candidate or something or running on a green new deal or running on we need to decarcerate and have restorative justice that's like ideals but when you get into office or even in governing too uh, even in campaigning too people are asking specifically concretely I'd love to as Paul McCartney once asked I'd love to see the plans you need plans You need ideas to fight for and you need to convert those ideals into a set of things. Let's talk about mass decarceration, for example. Yeah. You need to have an answer of how are we changing our parole system, our probation system, our mandatory minimum system, our clemency system, our geriatric release system. You know, that's just one area of like this ideal of abolishing prisons and mass decarceration. I just listed off five concrete things that need to go through some concrete committee process that people need to fight for. That is what we're trying to help with, with Deepin. That's why you, we need an interstate policy network on our side too. And so uh, that gets us to the thing we're uh, here to talk about, which is uh, the democracy policy network. Yeah, so is is that, that I take it that is the starting point for what the Democracy Policy Network is setting out to do. Yes. So what we're trying to do is to try to gather, package, organize and amplify state policies that in our words deepen democracy, extend more power to more people in more ways. So we are organizing, you know, a small part of a minor part of what we do is we organize state legislators that are the squad in every state house. That's like a phrase we like using. There's a squad in Congress we like talking about all the time, but in your state right now, it's very likely there is a squad in your state house trying to do as cool things as the squad in Congress is trying to do. And so we organize that squad in every state has to be part of the network. And then the majority of what we do is we build policy kits for them on 
issues ranging from how do we increase tenant unions or worker ownership or uh, mass decarceration or ranked choice voting or or what a state level Green New Deal would look like or what a public bank, how to establish a public bank, any of these ideas that are burbling up. We try to get them into a policy kit and get them to these legislators. And the, the thing I'm most proud of is we're doing this in a very participatory way. So Alec has money, you know, because they actually literally have corporations buy votes in Alec to vote on what policies they should support. And you could literally buy votes to ask Alec to support different policies. So we can on the left sell votes in what we're trying to do. So we don't have as much money, but we have people, as Ryan Grimm called his book, they have money, but we've got people. And so what we're doing is we're opening up a volunteer army of folks that are excited about writing these policy kits. So there are people in states all across the country that are brainy and wonky, but they might not be doing this professionally. They might have another day job. They might be a grad student. They might be this, that, or the other. But they're excited to help out, and their comparative advantage in helping out is reading and writing. And so we put them to work in making these policy kits and getting them to the state legislators. So we've already had two kits that have launched on public banks and democracy vouchers. We got three more coming on uh, this week on alternative voting methods and public digital wallets democratizing fintech and civil lawyers for all a library lawyer program and we're just trying to churn these out until we have kits about all the different issues that the movement's fighting for in the states and, and so when you say you know a policy kit i, I want to talk to you about like what what sorts of things are are would would be in that um let's take for example um you said me your uh, your public banks one where you you're sort of going through and you're explaining you know exactly how a public bank would work why it's useful giving examples showing you know what uh the, what the basic structure of the thing is explaining how they're capitalized giving a bunch of sources giving a bunch of um other pieces of legislation that people can look at giving you have a list of like uh, of experts that people can talk to and all their contact information you have uh uh yeah it's very rich yeah my goal is that you know let's say aoc runs for governor or something of new york or or whatever and she tasks a staffer with like oh go figure out my public banks plan or whatever i want that staffer to be like oh, damn it, I have to get this back to AOC by tomorrow. Uh, I'm Googling wildly. I'm Googling wildly. But then they happen upon our policy kit on public banks. I tell this to all of our kit makers. And they go, hallelujah, this has everything I need. <laughs> um, and so as you list it off, like we have five big modules to every kit. We have an intro that gives a sense of the problem, vision of the solution. Oftentimes, you know, legislators don't even know that this is a thing yet. So we need to just explain, this is a thing you can do, you know? We have a numbered list of elements that would go into the omnibus bill of like literally walking you through how to set this up. We have precedents, like the first thing everyone always asks is, has this been done before? So like in our public banks kit, we have a little story of the Bank of North Dakota, which is the only existing public bank in America, and the California AB 857, which was the first public banks law passed in 100 years, and other ones around the world and things like that a bullpen of experts so they know who to call as witnesses if they have a committee a meeting bullpen. or to flesh some, it. flesh something out. Yes, my baseball day is coming back. And then a syllabus of further reading. So if they want to read more. So we do that for every kit so that it's like a one-stop shop to get started in championing. This what idea. I, you know, what I like as a as a magazine editor is the first thing that comes to mind is actually that this is not just going to be useful for. I mean, you've designed this for people who are in government essentially to figure out you know we on the left are the are the big lofty abstraction people and then but but we you know actually doing things requires understanding the the nuts and bolts at a really fine great level and you know this obviously does give them that most of our listeners are not however state legislators right but i think what's 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 wonderful about this is that it actually serves many purposes because if you want to if you just want to understand how public banks work not because you're you're going 
going to set one up yourself. If you are someone who's going to write about this, this is, you know, this is a real cheat sheet for your research. You've got all the people here who you could interview, people who know everything about the topic, and you've got, you've even got the way to get in touch with them. (laughs) That is exactly part of the spirit here. Like the shtick is we're talking to state legislators, but we're not like every kit is public online. We're actually going to eventually print out the kits and send them in little designed booklets to state legislators, like to be part of the network. But every kit is public online. And we've already had journalists say to us, I've used your kit to do this. We've had activists say to us, I've used your kit to lobby my progressive state legislator to do something. Mm. Part of the goal of fleshing this all out is to add legitimacy to these policy ideas. Like a lot of times the wonks are wonks, but they don't have like structural vision. And then we have a lot of people on the left with structural vision, but they're not wonky. And we try to hit that middle of the Venn diagram of wonky, not letting that wonkiness moderate our ambitions. There's this quote I love that I sometimes draw inspiration from while working on Deepin, which is the critic George Shalaba, who we both love, Nathan, once wrote of Ralph Nader, one of my heroes. This is the quote. Whenever someone buttonholes me and demands to know my position on tort reform, corporate governance, campaign finance, regulatory enforcement, citizen utility boards, or reductions in the defense budget, I just reply, ask Uncle Ralph. He has all the details. (laughs) It's also, uh, to give a Nathan example, it's like when Noam Chomsky gets emailed about Jordan Peterson. They always say, just read this article that Nathan Robinson wrote about Jordan Peterson. The idea of having all the details is a powerful weapon in politics. It's not everything. You know, the Vox writers will not inherit the earth. (laughs) Like it's, it's the activists and the organizers and there's power and things like that. But someone's got to do all the details. And I see in like your big takedowns where you get all the links and write it all down. That meat adds a lot of heft to an argument that wouldn't have that meat. And what we're trying to do with policy is to put in the work to do the gathering and packaging and fleshing out to have all the details so that something is always there for someone to cite. Well, I loved, one of the things I loved about uh, when I went to Michigan to cover Abdul El Sayed's campaign for governor is he, uh, which was quite unusual for someone running a scrappy gubernatorial campaign, had a policy director, Rihanna Gunn Wright, uh, who is brilliant and who has been interviewed on the Carter Hero of mine as well. Podcast yes, amazing about, I mean, person. She's just incredible incredible one and um she had written all these policy briefs for abdul and it really really gave force to the arguments that he's making because abdul speaks in poetry he's brilliant uh you know he's brilliant on the stump he's very very inspiring but then you went to his website and you know one, one of his big issues he's just written a book um co-authored a book called Medicare for All, A Citizen's Guide. But if you asked him about single-payer health care, uh, Rihanna had written a state-level single-payer health care plan called Michicare. And you read it and you were like, my God, this is plausible. If he became the governor and we had a progressive state legislature, this is a single-payer plan for the state of Michigan that they've, they've run all the numbers, they've showed you how it could work, and it really, like... Policy, you know, I obviously I'm skeptical of wonks alone, but there is there is something very powerful about being able to say in response to people saying that'll never work, that'll never happen, that's pie in the sky, to say, well, actually, we've got all the numbers right, we, right here. You know, tell me why it won't work. We literally have written the plan. Uh, we've showed, in fact, we've showed exactly how it works somewhere else. Um, so, you know, I, I think it. I think it really adds a certain amount of heft and intellectual legitimacy to left politics. This is my dream. You know that eventually we have two hundred kits throughout deep and like deep in kind of you know event there's always new policies and there's new ideas but i it's kind of inspiring to me to think about it as a finite project at least like for a 10-year period or something like once you have about 200 of these kits in there you know we kind of have an agenda um and it's not us deciding what the agenda is it's usually gathering the kits from movements gathering the info from movements across the country that are already moving but once you have it there you know you really this is how the right 
gained power in the 70s and 80s. They hired a bunch of kind of intellectual workers that not only did the kind of intellectual conceptual framing on like liberty means liberty from government, but they also worked out like the details of a school voucher plan or how to, you know, how you'll survive on lower taxes. It's all wrong and it, it wasn't yeah. right what they said, but like they they put it into a form that granted it legitimacy and made it seem like the reasonable yes. thing. And you know, we're against utterly reasonable people here at Current Affairs, but like claiming the mantle of reasonableness is also a powerful tool yeah. because we do believe in our hearts that it is reasonable to have a more democratic society um, and that it works. And showing in detail all the different ways that it could work is possible. One thing I love that keeps our vision strong with Deep In Two is. Often the Democratic Party, I accuse it of policy potpourri. You ask them, what does the Democratic Party stand for? And they usually say, these 11 things yeah, <laughs> or right. something. And, um, and it's usually, you get to the point in any speech, even in Bernie's speeches, where they suddenly start listing off all the interest groups that are part of the big tent and what they're throwing to each of the interest groups. And the right doesn't have that. They have kind of a big, simple idea. You know, the powerful should stay powerful and there should be no democracy. And they call it there freedom. should be no government. I think they call it freedom. Yeah, they call it freedom or something. And the reason we call ourselves not the like state policy network or something, we call ourselves the democracy policy network is all of the policies we have flow from a very abstract vision. Yes. A very comprehensive vision of deepening democracy. And I can say a set of flowery phrases of what that means. More power to more people in more ways. Letting everyone have a voice in the forces that govern their lives empowering everyone to co-create our shared world freedom as not liberty from government but participation in power and so all of our kits are part of pillars or workshops strong people open country one nation within those strong bodies strong minds strong communities open government open economy open commons that that show how each of these kits might seem like a tiny wonky thing but they're all part of the garden of deepening democracy. And over time, through all these piecemeal efforts, you could wake up 30 years later and be in a much more deeper democracy than we are today. And one of the, I feel like, oh, by the way, you you, you keep saying uh, deepen. It's the Democracy Policy Network, so DPN would be the... Uh, the initials, but uh, it's, uh, yes, and we call it we, we call, call it deep in a shorthand because and it's, it's about deepening, to deepening democracy. Deepening democracy, <laughs> beautiful. Thank you for noticing. No, that. I I just wanted to make clear when when to people <laughs> when you were saying deepen that you mean the democracy policy network. I think one thing that has been disappointing to my generation of uh, you know I I'm a millennial. We you know Barack Obama's election was a very uh, pivotal political moment for us in one way or another and i think one thing that was so disillusioning about obama's presidency is that he spoke with all these in all these beautiful lofty abstract terms but eventually many of us came to feel like it wasn't clear what the meaning behind those terms was and what, one of the things that i like about what you do here is that you don't you don't, you don't shy away from as you say, the poetry, but you have, and I'm actually just looking at a at a chart here that you have, where you have like levels. You start with a big vision, which you call deep democracy. Then you have these pillars of 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 the of the deep democracy, and they're, they're these, they are these these kind of lofty values. But then you have an answer if someone says, okay, but you know, what does that what does that actually mean? What does that mean in in my life how you say strong people you say an open uh country what what are those things and then you say okay well let's talk about you know what a strong community is and then uh, in, on this chart you have examples of of strong communities and you have community land trusts tenant uh, unions. You have uh, fan-owned sports teams, which is a, a, a Ralph Nader issue, which I love. Uh, municipal internet. And then you take each of those, and, and as, as you say, your plan is to make it clear exactly how those would work, how you would build in the real world the structures that make those things function well. 
that is part of what we're trying to do. It's a very schematized project. Like, it has it has Pete Davis all over it. I have to say, by the way. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Pete loves schemas. You should listen to our Pete schemas episode. Yes, <laughs> I do love schemas, but it is literally me trying to through an elaborate institution call the bluff of people who say that people on the left don't know what they're talking about or they don't have clear ideas or they don't have an answer to this. And so when I say, you know. You know, like I'll walk, I'll walk down one. Let's do our democracy vouchers kit, yeah. which is about Seattle has done this. It gives everyone a voucher to spend on campaigns. They give them to candidates. The candidates can cash them in for campaign cash, and it democratizes the campaign finance system. You know, literally you could, there's a story of a guy walking to an encampment of people who don't have homes, handing them, making sure they sign up for all their democracy vouchers, and then holding a fundraiser in the encampment for the candidates to get the democracy vouchers. Vouchers. That's how democratizing democracy vouchers are. It sounds like a really wonky, lame thing, but it's one of the coolest things out there. Democracy vouchers is part of our open government workshop. Our open government also sounds like a really friendly phrase, but it's really about participatory government. How can we have our government not be controlled by a closed cartel, but be controlled by everyone? Our legislatures, our elections, our agencies, our courts have the participation of everyone. Open government is part of our open country pillar, which is about opening up our government and our economy to the participation of more people in more ways. The inst- It's not enough to just have strong people. We need to open our institutions to the participation of those people. And open country is one of our pillars, along with strong people and one nation, one nation about racial and gender justice and other justice movements that make up what a deeper democracy could be, what a country that is free, with free being defined as participation in power, not just liberty from government. Yeah, and the whole idea is you look at this whole thing as we're building it, by fleshing out what these policies mean and how they fit into this framework, you can start to see that there is an alternative. Like this whole thing is the answer to Margaret Thatcher saying there is no alternative. I want someone to look at Deepin and say, there's thousands of alternatives. And there's one giant alternative called democracy that we've uh, has ebbed and flowed in our history that we can uh, make. Is ebb the good one? Ebb again? <laughs> oh, I never <laughs> is remember. Is ebb or flow the good one? I never know. Uh, Whatever dep- the good I, one d- is, d- depend on what, Yeah, right. Uh, deepen again. To deepen again rather than weaken and shallow. How, how has it worked in, in, in Seattle? Is it going okay? The democracy vouchers? Yeah. Democracy vouchers have gone great. They've increased the amount of candidates. Most candidates are participating in it. Um, you're, you're, you're having an Ask Uncle Ralph for the details moment, but I will tell you. They have many more people participating in finance, uh, in campaign finance. Usually it's a very small amount of people. And, you know, one of the wonderful things that has been a joy of working on this is you get to see all these local stories. Right. So let me start with democracy vouchers. Totally non-known national news story. South Dakota, South Dakota, totally red state, had a statewide initiative to establish democracy vouchers for the state. And it passed 52 to 48. Oh. And the only reason it wasn't implemented statewide in South Dakota is because the governor implemented an emergency ordinance to, like, stop the referendum stop saying democracy. it would, like, destroy the state. <laughs> like, democracy was such a threat. We need to call a state of emergency that the legislature <laughs> voted against. So when I learned about that, yeah. I go back to my state legislature in Virginia, which is a blue trifecta state, meaning both houses and the governor. And they tell me, oh, this democracy vouchers thing is so extreme. You don't, you don't understand. We're a recently new blue trifecta to state. We're mostly a purple state. And I say, why did South Dakota pass at 5248? Yeah. Why is the only public bank in North Dakota? Why are worker cooperatives present in most of the landmass of the United States, you know, bringing energy to the majority of the landmass of the United States? Why are you telling me we can't have ranked choice voting when Utah allowed all of their locales to do it and Alaska and Maine have done it? Why are you saying we can't have a better parole system than Mississippi, which ranks higher than most blue trifecta states when ranked by the prison? and policy initiative. There is hope in the states. Well, Congress is stalled. We all need to fight on Congress. You know, I I would be dishonoring Ralph Nader's legacy by telling you to turn away from Congress. He always says, like, we must all look at Congress and watchdog Congress. But, well, you're also watchdogging Congress. Know that your state legislature is where a lot of alternatives can be tried and a lot of hope can be sprouted. Yeah, I mean, the reason I I ask you about uh, uh, Seattle is because uh, every time you read about something where you're like, 
I have absolutely no idea that happened there. It's actually, it can be difficult to find out what is going on in places, partly because the disappearance of local newspapers and the fact that the remaining local newspapers have all turned to paywalls means that it, it, it can be almost impossible to actually find out what is going on in cities other than your own because you don't want to pay for a subscription to the Philadelphia Inquirer if you don't live in Philadelphia, but there might be some news story about some cool thing that has been done in Philadelphia. You will never read about it you will never know about it there is this just this this information gap where our focus is is i mean the focus of the national political press is completely on not even just on congress but on whatever like right now it's been on the the impeachment trial right so that's you watch cnn nothing else is going on about other than in american politics other than the impeachment trial and the covid relief thing nothing else that's it that's politics right now (laughs) But that's not politics. <laughs> Two things on this. One, very directly on local news. But first, in the States, it's a much more exciting news story. You know? Yeah. Oregon. I'm pronouncing it wrong. I or- apologize for all the Oregonians. <laughs> or is it Oregon? They have gone further with Measure 110 to decriminalize all drug use. While everyone else is, like, fighting over, like, should we just decriminalize pot? We're all fighting over ranked choice voting. St. Louis implemented approval voting, an even weirder <laughs> voting system. In, also in Oregon, Oregon has a lot of our, our uh, things. They have free summer camp for all. They have a week of guaranteed free summer camp because they decided outdoor ed was so important to guarantee to every, you know, every child there. We had all this fight about the protests uh, with racial justice and police reform, accountability and abolition. And a bunch of states and cities are starting to make moves on that. And there are places where whole cities where they're moving entire portfolio items of police departments over to a fourth first responder that is like social workers appearing in the ambulance when you like have a, a, a need, not police. And these stories are much more exciting than hearing if Yuri, you know, whatever uh, Russian talked to whoever. And I just really wish, you know, if Rachel Maddow, if you're listening, <laughs> cover some of these stories in your A block. It would be amazing. And it would show people what they should fight for in their states rather than the palace intrigue of the previous administration. On local news generally, I just want to say I'm very proud of you bringing this up. We are currently working on a kit on citizen news vouchers, Ah. which are an idea where every citizen gets a a certain voucher that they can spend on local news. Um, And thus a way you can have public funding of news without having public control, like government control of news, which is a tricky problem. The way you can solve that is give it to the citizens, but then the citizens, no matter their wealth, can decide if they want to support a newspaper or not with a subscription. And that's an example of a thing that's not precedented anywhere. But there have been professors that have written up all the details of this. There's all these professors across the country that have come up with alternatives. They've written them in law reviews. They've written them in like one-off New Republic essays. They might have proposed it in current affairs at some random point, but then they're like, I wrote my thing on it. I'm done. I'm moving on. Um, We want to take those things out and put them into a form that says, let's try to pass this, you know? And I feel like, you know, eventually you you will probably also not just report on examples from around other states and cities, but around the world, because America, one of the reasons that uh, Americans feel like this, m- many things that should or seem like they should be easy or impossible is because Americans aren't really told that the rest of the world exists or what happens in it. Because, like, I mean, healthcare, for example, like, the only reason we have any discussion at all about, like, whether Medicare for All is realistic is because there is no understanding of the fact that, like, other countries have just solved this problem. Like, like a single government insurer solves solves a series of problems. And you could look at countries where you just have to look at it. We've got it. We've got all the data. We've got all the models. It functions. You just import the model, and then you and then you and you fix the financing of healthcare. And one of the things that I love about this is that it it makes the world less bleak, because I I feel, and I know a lot of other lefties feel, you feel very very hopeless because the gap between what ought to exist and what does exist is so great and it gets you down so much then and you feel you feel like especially after after these abstract terms hope and change have been used in ways that feel uh empty 
you can develop a, a real cynicism and a real pessimism and a real sense of like, well, how is this ever, you know, the disappearance of all these newspapers? Well, how are we ever going to get the, they're just all going away. Well, I can't build a newspaper. What could I ever do other than uh, this is, this can only just, this trend can only get worse and worse and worse. But what you do with this is you sort of counteract this in a way. I, I have always been a defender of utopia, of like practical utopias, which is presenting people with something that makes them go, oh, I can actually kind of see that happening and it would solve the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's like, not to schematize it, I told, amen to everything but you just said, I'll but not to schematize it, but I will. This is kind of the cycle of how change happens. One is you start with criticism. You start like we start with radical criticism and then kind of the fleshing out of the radical criticism of, oh, this thing we're doing is completely messed up. <laughs> you know, this is completely inadequate and failure. And you do a lot of writing on the criticism and that denaturalizes, knocks the halo off of some aspect of the status quo. The next phase is you come up with an alternative vision. So, for example, I recently tweeted about this. For every problem and failure in American public life, there are people that have come up with, almost every, there are people that have come up with the alternative vision. There's this wonderful book called Nurturance Culture, which is about the opposite of rape culture. They said, you know, we've clarified what rape culture is. Now let's talk about what nurturance culture is, what a world, what an affirmative world would be that would displace rape culture. We've talked about what the housing problem is. We can now talk about inclusive zoning or social housing. We've talked about what the corporate control is. Let's talk about cooperativism and commoning. We've talked about what like a miserated individualized labor is. Let's talk about the labor movement. We've talked about the climate crisis. Let's talk about the Green New Deal. So you come up with this alternative and then the next step is to flesh out and concretize that alternative vision into actual institutional reforms and institutional design. And um, that's where we come in, which is we are looking at all these alternative burgeoning visions and we're trying to find what are the alternative burgeoning institutional designs and reforms within them that are happening and popping up all over. And let's write those down, gather, package, organize, and amplify them to the people that can make them happen. And internationally, that's where a lot of, you're seeing a lot of them just to do a, I'm sorry that Mardi Gras is diminished, so I'll give you an alternate alternate parade, which is a parade of examples. Oh. In New Zealand, what a, what they a have, disappointing replacement. Yes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. In New Zealand, Nathan, they have a restorative justice, automatic restorative justice trigger where if the victim of a crime wants to participate in a restorative process, it automatically is a right that you could have. They also have that in DC for kids. In the Netherlands, they have legal services counters where anyone can walk up and get legal advice for free public charge, uh, free of public charge. In Germany, they have these middle stand competence centers where any small or medium sized enterprise can get technology help so that they can compete with the big guys. And they have like, I think a huge portion of their public, of their financing done by these county level municipal public banks. And that's why so much of green energy happened in Germany because these, these municipal public banks were able to fund all these green energy projects, whereas we're relying on like private extractive finance. And, you know, in, in Australia and Brazil, they have mandatory voting. Why do you think Lula, you know, it, it doesn't automatically create good outcomes. So I actually, I'll take away the citations, but mandatory voting, which drastically increases increases the amount of people participating, like can result in much better uh, things. History and the world and even the states around us are a storehouse of alternatives waiting to be gathered, packaged, organized, amplified, championed and written into law in your state. Yeah, and, and I, what I love is when people look through, and again, you're, you're only at the beginning of, of this process. So, you know, you, you've developed a number of these uh, policy kits to, to showcase, but this is a giant project because of the level of detail that you're going into on every subject. But if we look at, if you look at the kind of map, the broad map of the, of the areas that you're addressing, it is true, as you say, that for every problem that people can can think of you you have something that uh, addresses it in in one of these in one of these 
categories. You know, if you talk, if you th- the problem of, of exploitation, of labor exploitation and workplace, you have, you know, wor- the ways of building worker ownership and labor power. And uh, uh, if you talk about, you have uh, the, the problems of uh, the uh, opiate epidemic and, and drug pricing, you have a, a public uh, public pharma uh, proposal. Uh, if you talk about affordable housing crisis, you have you have a social social housing plan. You talk about food deserts. You have a secu- food security plan. You know, as you say, you talk about mass incarceration. You have uh, a, a a decarceration plan. What about the fact that people can't afford lawyers when they get screwed over? Well, you have this civil lawyers for all plan, right? The disappearance of local newspapers. You you know, and, and so and, and so it's wonderful because it does feel like it gives you the, the beginnings of a, of a way to to think about if if people have a particular particular thing that is is their passion even even if they don't end up thinking sharing the particular democracy policy net, network solution it's going to give them a start at the very least for like here's a bunch of proposal here's some things we could do this is what's been done elsewhere and i i, I just i just feel excited reading it <laughs> Oh, I'm so happy to hear that, Nathan. That is the goal. It's supposed to be hope inducing. And it's supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be something where, you know, sometimes people work on a kit with us. And it's been fun watching. We have like dozens of people working on kits right now. And if you are listening, please reach out to us. There's a big join up button in the top right to volunteer to work on a kit. And they talk to me about, you know, oh, I'm working on this kit on, you know, on this or that issue. But it seems so small relative to all the problems. And the thing is, anything one person can do is so small. Anything one huge group of people can do is so small relative to all the problems. We need, that's why we need to have larger ideologies and larger ideological movements and, you know, the Geist in in society across all countries or whatever um, to move the world in a direction. And, but what I'm trying to do by linking these all together is to say, you working on this, well, these dozens of other people are working on that. Well, you're getting this go in that state. Well, someone's getting this go in that state. And you're seeing how it spreads like fire and resonance across. You can feel like the work you do in this is contributing to the grand work of deepening all of democracy. So, you know, rest assured and, you know, keep moving forward with this. That's the kind of purpose of connecting each of the little things that we do to a larger structural thing. And that's the hope there. I, I hope we've managed to get people excited about about this because, as I say, I, I've, you know, you, you've been talking about this and dreaming about this for for a long time, and I, I I've been I've been looking forward to it. And I I see, I see now looking at the materials why it has taken a while to come together because it is a vast vast undertaking, um, and it's really exciting that it's actually you know coming to 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 fruition. When people when people see this, I think they're really going to be impressed by the amount of just the amount. Of, of work and detail that is that is going into it but so I want to ask you what what stage are things at right now and what do you, you know is there a thing that you want uh, readers of current affairs and and listeners to our to our podcast uh, to do I mean I know that this is there as a as a resource for them but uh, yeah this is an opportunity to ask, yeah so to all, make demands. All to thank you oh. Yes. Okay. So the ask, as they say, I will walk you from kind of least engaged to most engaged of how we'd love you to follow along. So on least engaged, you know, we'd love you to, you know, go to democracypolicy.network and you can find, you know, all the kits we have there, what the vision is, read our white paper, you know, see our current existing kits on public banks and democracy vouchers and others and subscribe to our sub stack where you can kind of get the same email that we're sending to, you know, all the leaders as well. So you can kind of keep abreast of all the exciting kind of kits that are being made. One step up is we are the reason we're having this conversation now, even though we've existed for a while is we are launching a patreon to help fund this patreon link in the show notes you can also you know you can go to our website and find the patreon we're also launching a podcast with it it is going to be very wonky so it will not compete with the current affairs podcast do not worry it's called this is what democracy looks like where we're interviewing some of the experts every week on different policy ideas and it's for you who want to kind of wonk out on what can I fight for in my state of these transformative policy ideas so support the Patreon listen to the podcast then the ways you could actually get actively involved is 
we need people, we call them policy organizers and policy researchers who make these kits. It's all driven. They got money, but we got people. We'd love if you have a policy or want to be assigned a policy to gather, package, and organize for a kit on Deepin. This whole thing is powered by people like you. We've gotten a lot of our great policies written by current affairs people who first heard about this through current affairs. And if you are connected to a state legislator, put us in touch with them so we can get them involved in our network and reach out to us. And then, you know, if you're connected to someone who wants to help fund a uh, uh, interstate policy infrastructure or is a leader in the movement in the states, please put us in touch with them or if you are one as well. And the most important one, the whole goal of this whole thing is take our policies and advocate for them, write articles about them. Advocate for them in your state house. Run statewide campaigns on them. Forward them along to your state legislator, or your favorite governor, or lieutenant governor, or attorney general, well, candidate, or your city, of and course, tell them, right? Because it's uh... or your city. Many of them have total city angles to them. Some are state specific, but a lot. I'd say the majority, vast majority of them are things that could be citywide as well. Uh, well, everyone should go uh, to. You said it's the the address is democracy policy dot network yes where you can read some of you can read the launch plans you can read the vision you can read the agenda you can read some of the kits and you can get involved in the ways that pete described i'm excited for the podcast because i you know one thing i have discovered over the course of um current affairs is that there are so many people out there who are brilliant and spend all of their time like thinking about how to solve a problem or just who have so much knowledge and you just you just meet them you just like send them an email and you you ask them like a question and they're like excited to talk to you because yes. like nobody's ever uh, the people don't ask them about this thing that they spend their entire life fascinated by and they're just waiting for that email from someone who actually wants to take all of this knowledge that they've been building up for so long and you're like wow because at first you think like oh I'm bothering this person and then you realize that you that actually Amen. like they've been waiting for you <laughs> <laughs> that is we've discovered that as we've been making our kits and we're excited you know we've been having all these private fascinating conversations to make the kits yeah and the whole reason we started the podcast this is what democracy looks like is that we wanted to have an audience you know i'm sure there are listeners out there people working in state houses or involved in state advocacy or just want to wonk out on state policy that would love to listen in on these super excited people that are doing amazing things i I literally have a 100% hit rate on calling experts about a state policy and leaving completely inspired and wanting yeah. to tell everyone annoyingly in my life about what they told me. So, as I say, it's not just if you're if you I if you're wonky. I do think there is an element of this that is like that there is a therapeutic almost feeling to hearing someone discuss a problem in ways that make it seem less overwhelming. Yes. Because that is one of the most serious problems facing us and that it just kills our morale is that everything feels overwhelming and feels impossible. Unger, my my other favorite hobby horse on the Current Affairs podcast, this philosopher, Roberto Unger, has this phrase, hope is not the cause of action. Hope is the consequence of action. And that's what I've discovered with all these experts and advocates we've talked to, which is the people that really look under the hood, it's kind of it's kind of bimodal. They both find the problem worse than you would just thinking about it. Like the people who are experts on, you know, mass incarceration, they're like, it's much worse than even the tell all Harper's piece does. Like it's even worse than anything that could be written down. But they're also the most hopeful in being like, oh, did you know Houston's doing this and Nevada's doing this and we, we're about to pass this thing and they see the path forward because they kind of do the action and that gives them hope. And so get a little taste of that with talking to some of these people and listening. In. The Nevada people are going to be as pissed as the Oregon, but don't they say Nevada? Yeah, or, no, Oregon. Or what, what, what else am I Nevada. pronouncing wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Minnesota. You got. If you're gonna Wisconsin. do a state thing, you're gonna have to learn all the uh, all Mariah the idiosyncratic <laughs> pronunciations. Yeah, no, this, of the, uh... this is my greatest flaw. Yeah, you know, I should be an expert on pronouncing these states. Well, always a great pleasure to talk to you. Good luck with the uh, the big launch of the uh, of Deepin. Thank you, Nathan. Keep up the good fight. 